Yeah, in, in California, we have a dry season and a wet season. Keeping everything alive requires technology. I have, uh, have many different Raspberry Pi systems and everything controlling. There's actually a project called Open Sprinkler for open source hardware software that I've been contributing uh, to. It's, it's a lot of fun to see how you can really make, uh, bring new efficiency and ease of use and better maintenance, even prediction, into something as simple as, as uh, watering your garden. Uh, but I'm going to talk uh, not about IoT uh, uh, today too much, although I'm going to squeeze it in wherever I can. Uh, but I, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, how some uh, businesses have approached going uh, digital and some of the uh, strategies that have made them successful doing that and, and show some examples of, of how that works. So hopefully this will be uh, give you some ideas, some, some inspiration. I don't think any business can literally copy the strategy of another business. Uh, as Sanjeeva indicated, the software, the, the digital transformation is core to the uh, central competitive advantage that you uh, provide a, as a business. And so finding your unique uh, way to transform, the unique uh, proposition that you can get by going digital is, is, uh, can't really be shared uh, very well across industries or even across uh, companies because those that figure it out the best will be at the top of the heap. But there's a lot of, I, a part of uh, getting there is having a lot of ideas and models and experimenting and brainstorming and being creative about the business, about technology, about how those two things intersect. So maybe a few examples here to help get the, the juices flowing uh, on that. And I, I wanted to, again, uh, distinguish uh, the uh, digital native uh, businesses uh, that uh, are out there. Um, it is actually, in a lot of ways, easier to start as a digital native uh, business. You uh, start with your idea for your digital product. We've, we all know these examples. Uh, Uber, uh, as a digital native, it's a, it's a transportation company that doesn't own any, any cars. Um, Airbnb is, a, is a, essentially a, a hotel that doesn't own any properties. Um, uh, Amazon and eBay, these are uh, retailers that often don't own the, the products uh, that, that they are uh, selling. They don't maintain their own inventory on a lot of the products that they do and so forth. Uh, StubHub, of course, uh, is, I don't know if they're here in the U.S., they're a big, uh, big reseller of tickets. It's a marketplace for selling event tickets and reselling event tickets. It's kind of scalping uh, online, if, if you will. Uh, very successful over there. They don't actually run any uh, events themselves. They just help, uh, help uh, event uh, uh, organizers and of people who have tickets uh, get those to the people who, who want them. Spot Hero, again, uh, parking space. I've highlighted a few of these in, in blue uh, just for, um, for disclosure. <laughs> Uber isn't a, a customer of WSO2, but they do use some of our streaming analytics uh, technology, so I wanted to highlight that. They're, they use uh, our, uh, our streaming analytics processor to predict and analyze behaviors of both drivers and riders to predict various types of um, misbehavior, I'm not sure I'd call it fraud, but denying a ride after you've accepted it or, you know, calling an Uber and then, you know, once you see who the driver is declining the ride, they can actually predict some of these misbehaving uh, 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 behaviors and uh, address them using our streaming analytics. eBay has been a, a good customer of ours for many years. Uh, all of the transactions that go through eBay from any of their APIs through their website all hit WSO2 at some point. And StubHub, uh, we manage the entire API ecosystem, their developer portal and all of that. Uh, the, all the APIs that run their website, which is also highly API driven, all run through WSO2. So I just wanted to highlight those uh, as interesting uh, uh, customer stories for us. Uh, but mostly, I think for us in the room and for, for most existing enterprises, it's not about <clears throat> starting from scratch as a digital native, but trying to figure out if we, you can actually get there first before a digital native comes along and eats your lunch for you. Uh, so, so these are some of the uh, examples I think that, that we've uh, 
I've chosen here uh, out of a group of many, many companies who are, who are working, who have evolved very uh, effectively and continue to evolve in a digital way. Uh, Netflix is a great example. Initially, they simply had a huge inventory of DVDs and they would mail them to you instead of having you go down to the, to the, uh, the Blockbuster store. And Blockbuster is no more. Netflix uh, took over that business. But they didn't start there. The video rental, the re one of the reasons they were good is because it could personalize your queue and it could recommend movies for you. You could tee up movies. So you did, it helped you with that horrifying experience of going to Blockbuster and having 1,000 DVDs and none of them actually are ones you wanted to watch. So they were able to add a service layer on top of that, but then they went into digital content, so no longer mailing physical artifacts, and now they've evolved into one of the most exciting uh, content producers that are out there. The number of shows that they sponsor and movies that they sponsor for the Netflix studios is, is really uh, important. So they've gone from kind of a, a service which ships things by mail into the, what customers really want, which is direct access to entertainment. So they're getting closer and closer to uh, the, the core of their business, which is entertainment, through pursuing an aggressive digital strategy. And clearly, you know, mailing DVDs by mail, that's not going to last forever. Um, uh, so it, they were very timely in doing that. Blockbuster could have gone into the same thing, but they had a lot of bricks and mortar that they wanted to defend. They uh, unfortunately did not move into this fast enough and really are, are not a player anymore. Uh, Sanjeeva mentioned Hilti as well. I think this is a very exciting uh, uh, company where instead of building tools and then selling them from you know, small tools like handheld drills and saws and so forth, all the way up to very uh, complex uh, equipment and, and loaders and, and large, uh, the kind of equipment you would need to build skyscrapers and so forth, they are really looking at how they don't sell tools, but they make the capability of the tools available when and where you need it. So managing where that tool is through GPS and geofencing, uh, being able to sell access to the tool by the hour instead of having to buy the tool uh, outright for when you need it. All of these are digital business models that are more directly uh, related to what the users need, which is, I need this kind of tool to do this function at this point in time at this location. Can Hilti actually deliver that to you uh, using more and more digital uh, services and, and take the management, the maintenance, the, uh, the security of the, of the tools and, uh, and probably a lot of the capital expenditure for those tools out of the equation. Uh, Safeway, uh, they're, um, I think they have some presence in Australia, but they're a, a large chain in, in the U.S. Uh, a lot of my examples are ones I'm more familiar with from, from uh, being in California. Uh, they have, over the last few years, done a lot of experiments in providing online shopping experience. And again, taking that, that, uh, that bricks and mortar presence and leveraging it with a better uh, customer loyalty and, and purchasing experience in order to get uh, groceries packed for you for pickup at the store or delivered uh, to you in a very easy uh, uh, to do way. Uh, I think Sanjeev already talked about Hilton enough. It's a very e exciting way to, uh, to change the customer experience, but also it, that will drive more, uh, inevitably, more uh, IoT because they have physical buildings, they have location data, they have many devices that, uh, that the patrons uh, interact with. So uh, we expect to see them adopting more and more IoT as part of the part of creating a new digital experience for their customers. Uh, one of my favorites is, is simple, it's Starbucks. Uh, they just, they have a, uh, a Starbucks application uh, on the phone. Uh, it was uh, designed initially uh, to enable, uh, as a loyalty app, so you could keep track of, of your purchases and after a certain number of purchases you get a free drink. Uh, you can redeem it, but they also added payment capabilities, so it's very easy to just swipe your phone at the, at the, um, at the counter, and it, it pays uh, for it. And they've expanded that beyond simply payment and, and loyalty, but uh, to uh, many other uh, functions. They have uh, uh, now partnerships with mobile app developers and with uh, music producers to have a a free download of the week from, from a, uh, an artist that you may not have, have heard of or an app that they recommend. And it's a way now to bring in new revenue for, and new partnerships to help converge music industry, 
app industry with the coffee culture in an interesting way. And one of my favorite features is, um, my daughter actually introduced me to this app. Uh, I said, oh, how does it work? She said, oh, dad, I'll install it for you. So she installed it with her account and my credit card. So whenever she goes there, she gets a free Starbucks. And I know exactly where she is because my phone dings and says, would you like to leave a tip? And I can tell exactly where she is. If she's late coming home from school and the phone dings, oh, she went by Starbucks. So now I can geotrack my daughter uh, using Starbucks uh, uh, beacon. So I think that's, a, that's worth, the, uh, worth the unlimited account for, uh, for Starbucks for me. So, you know, you can see I've now layered on top of that uh, some interesting customer behavior that really helps my family out. You can see there's still a lot of potential for Starbucks to go farther and farther uh, into that digital transformation. And so I want to give some more examples and some maybe some patterns that we've observed on how some of our customers and others that, we've, that are uh, well known in the industry have started to, to uh, transform digitally. And one strategy is simply uh, incremental evolution. Take what you have today and start to build new digital experiences, new operational efficiencies, or new digital products on top of that. And I'll use finance as kind of an example of an industry that is, uh, from a lot of the examples that we've seen, uh, is evolving. Um, the finance industry has similar challenges to many uh, at the high level. They need to attract new customers. They need to retain their existing customers. They want to operate as efficiently as they can. And they, uh, of course, would love to get new revenue streams uh, if they can find them, and maybe through digital products. So some of the things that you'll see uh, a, digi a finance company do, all their information is already digital. So they have a very uh, technology-focused, and uh, there's not a lot of uh, they don't have bricks and mortar uh, 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 products anymore. They do have to deal with cash for a small bit, but really it's all about databases and procedures and processes and security. It's already a very digital and electronic uh, business. Um, one of the things you can do with that is attract new customers through using all the data that they already have in new smart ways by connecting it up, uh, using identity, common identity to match up different behaviors, and to come up with ideas for using the, the existing data sets that, that they already have. It's really, they have a data set, they just need new algorithms in order to do, uh, to, for instance, figure out how to offer the right product to an individual at the right time instead of spamming them with, with email at, at all times. You don't want to get a, a, uh, you know, a, a, an email saying, um, you, you know, if you're a 20-something, you get an email that says, hey, we have new investment products specially designed for seniors. You're just going to start spam, putting them in your spam list, and you'll never see any offer from the bank again. So getting the right offer at the right time can be very uh, effective in the sea of marketing that we all receive every day. Yeah, there's a lot of existing uh, data out there with the purchasing trends from uh, your credit card and bank account, the demographic information that they have. If you've gotten a loan through your bank, there's a lot of information about the assets you have, your credit history, um, and uh, other aspects of your, of your uh, purchasing history. Um, all of these can then uh, be uh, combined even with uh, data from third parties or from publicly uh, available information such as um, yeah, the Twitter feeds. If, if uh, your customer has followed you on Twitter, you can also see, uh, see what they're tweeting about, maybe use that information to try and, and uh, give them an offer. For instance, if they're tweeting about uh, car shopping, maybe it's a good time to send them uh, a special offer on, on financing from your bank. Uh, that will uh, forestall them from just going through the, the uh, financing rut that the, that the car dealer uh, might try and push them down. So that's a, a good example of, of uh, uh, an interesting way to attract customers, retain, retaining customers. I guess uh, my uh, funk got off a little bit here. Um, so uh, f a prediction is, is a very uh, useful technique uh, in finance, you might be able to look at some of these uh, data points uh, or telltale signs that uh, might say that a customer uh, is at higher risk of churn. 
Uh, maybe there's a decrease in their card activity or maybe there's, uh, there's some cancellation of orders. Maybe they're, they're accruing fees more rapidly than they have in the past. Is there, this might be an opportunity to reach out and see if there's some new products, new services or alternate products or services that you could offer in order to keep them as a customer and prevent them from churning and build a, a strong customer loyalty. And if you can keep a customer maybe through the dip, you know, when they come out of the dip and have more assets and are willing to buy more products, you have a, a, a strong relationship with that customer that you can leverage. Oh. Sorry, so all of these, uh, these uh, data points that you might look at, or the, the telltale signs you might look at, you already have a lot of information about where they, they are. You have this data. The digital transformation exercise is, is connecting up this data feeding your software with data, and then figuring out what is the right prediction, what are the prediction metrics that you want to do, and what's the algorithm for predicting the behaviors here uh, that will give you the, the results you need. So again, it's a software problem. We're building software. Software has eaten that bit of the world. Another uh, way that you can improve your, the, the finance companies are always looking for ways to improve their fraud detection. It goes right to the bottom line, it goes right to customer satisfaction. Um, so, uh, being able to use a, a system that can convert your, uh, the domain knowledge you have about customer behavior into repeatable queries so that you can look for patterns uh, emerging is the kind of central uh, role of a real-time analytics uh, 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 system that can work in the context of, of that customer. It can look at, at uh, uh, different time windows to see how behavior and different events are happening over time in order to, to detect certain fraud. Um, there's even an ability to detect fraud that you don't know about by figuring out how to model uh, uh, normal behavior and then look using, using machine learning and say, here's what normal behavior looks like. Tell me if anything abnormal happens. And I can look at that closer and see if there might be fraud going on. So uh, both writing rules kind of by hand for your business and inferring rules and patterns through machine learning are both uh, valuable techniques in detecting fraud. Um, there's some, there's much higher level things besides just on a single customer, but looking at streams across institutions even, uh, looking at the, with things like Markov models, looking at the statistical chance of, of, uh, of events happening to see if, if there's anomalies happening across multiple streams. A good fraudster is going to break up transactions into a lot of chunks and distribute them. Uh, a real-time analytics has a, a system that can look at patterns across many streams, has a better chance of, of, uh, of fighting against those. And then once you have sometimes, you know, with fraud, you say, here's a warning for fraud, and then you still need maybe a human to go back and look at it. So how can you build ways to trace, better trace, uh, visualize uh, what's going on in order for the, to enable the human to really understand what the fraud is and to, and to pursue the, the right actions once the system has done their work. Another way, uh, there's many, many other ways, of course, to improve the operations of a financial group, and these are common across many different in industries. You know, there's, uh, for instance, we have uh, one uh, prospect now who's looking at using IoT devices to control the air conditioning in their ATM kiosks in order for m maximum efficiency and customer uh, comfort. When the ATM booth is not being used, they can turn the air conditioning off. When it's, when it's being used a lot, they can, they can keep it high. So, Oper there's many, many ways to, to optimize uh, just the general business. So you'll see that happening across many in industries. All of those things improve the way uh, a bank works today. They already do fraud, de fraud detection. This helps them do it better. But the next level, I think, it, it, that many financial uh, organizations are looking at is how do we build new products get new revenue streams that, that we haven't captured before or ideally that nobody else in the industry has, has even captured before. And uh, by using this data, um, you have a, a huge amount of, of insight and you have a, an asset that you can use combined with the creativity of your business and software and technologists to try and figure out ways to to uh, monetize that. I think Sanjeeva's example of, of taking data uh, for risk uh, evaluation that you could then sell off to insurance companies was a good one. There's a lot of similar uh, ways that, uh, you know, that your financial information can help uh, target advertising, 
um, and other, other products uh, to you. So there are chances for simply opening up monetized APIs as a new revenue stream, but also you may want to open up APIs that aren't directly monetized, but help enable an ecosystem to form around you. Third-party app developers or your business partners maybe can, can integrate directly in order to provide new revenue streams that, that, uh, that are fed entirely through the APIs. Let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, another strategy besides just the evolution from where you are, maybe one that's a little more revolutionary, which is in the experience realm. I'll use retail and e-commerce as an example uh, here because it's such a rich, a rich uh, uh, fertile ground for uh, innovation and digital transformation. This is kind of what you see today, the state of the art is you would expect an e-commerce site to uh, understand the aggregate behavior of all its buyers in order to recommend, make recommendations on what might be the next thing you purchase, the next thing you shop for, a uh, bundle that you might want to get. You know, when you buy camera, you need an SD card. We, we actually can recommend one that other customers have bought and had a high satisfaction rate with, make it very easy, click on the button, add all these to the basket. Uh, very, very, it's a, it's a great uh, way to increase the sales and to, to help the customers. But how do we go beyond that. I think there's many, many different ways that uh, retail organizations are looking to streamline the, the uh, purchase experience, especially you know, from the bricks, uh, bricks and mortar standpoint. How do we actually leverage the bricks and mortar presence we have uh, and our e-commerce site together? So we're seeing, of course, you know, the, the more and more companies are, are adopting the streamlined purchasing channel through one-click ordering like on Amazon. Um, an interesting uh, example for the purchase experience at Apple stores where there isn't a central cashier that you stand in line and bring your, your wares to the cashier and they eventually will check you out as a favor to you. But instead, it's a new relationship where you're working directly with a human. You say, this, thank you for your help. This is what I want to buy. And they whip out their, their iPhone. They swipe your credit card right there. They say, would you like me to email the receipt? And you go your way. Very different relationship. It's a one-on-one -on -one personal relationship. We've seen other, other uh, stores adapting that, especially things like a holiday rush where the lines at the cashiers can get very big. You know, there's an expedited way to have, oh, can I, you just pay for that on a card right here? If you need cash, Cash, please go to the cashier, but I can take your card here and, and uh, get you on your way. Um, uh, Sanjeev also mentioned the, the Amazon uh, Go store. A lot of potential there for allowing people to go in and pay for themselves uh, via their app uh, without interaction with the clerk at all. So being able to go in and say, I like this shirt or I like this banana, and basically connect up and say, you know, I'm going to buy it myself through my mobile app right here, walk out the store and not have to actually wait to try and find a, a, a clerk in order to do that. Um, another uh, one that's uh, another strategy is helping people find what they need through, a, through an integrated physical and uh, online presence. So Home Depot is our big building uh, home, home improvement store. Uh, when you go there, it's a vast warehouse of products. Sometimes it can be hard to find what you want. So often I will check on the mobile app first or on their website. You know, I'm looking for this. You know, where is, do you have that in stock at my local store? Is it the store that's farther away? How many are in stock? What aisle is it on? Uh, uh, what bin is it in? So I can go directly there. And I can use that inside the store because they have free Wi-Fi in the store uh, as well in order to help me find, locate things uh, very quickly on myself and not have to wait around and try and chase down a clerk and say, hey, uh, where's your, I'm looking for this plumbing part, where is it? And they have to you know, take 10 minutes to help me buy a, you know, a $2 item. It's not a very efficient way to do it. So it's great. Also, you know, sometimes I say, oh, there's five at this store and there's seven at that store and I need 10, so I'm going to have to go to both stores. <laughs> or maybe I say, ah, I can wait. I'm just going to order them up, have them pack it up when the stock comes in, wait three or four days. I can go pick up all 10 right from the front desk. So a lot of uh, ways to op uh, optimize the shopping experience around stock uh, as well. Starbucks, that's uh, another, another thing the app now allows is ordering ahead. If I don't want to wait in line, I can just say, okay, give me my usual and I'll be there in 10 minutes and it'll be waiting for me. I just go in. It's already paid for on my app. I just go in. I say I'm here for my latte and I pick it up and go. So it's a 
as a very, you can now imagine taking that to the next level, which is things like the app detecting, you know, you are almost to work, and, you know, four days out of five, you stop by Starbucks and pick up a chai. Um, would you like to do that again today? And if you say yes, it'll order it for you, it'll tell you where it is, it'll be ready for you when you arrive. So you can see how that can really start to change, continue to evolve the experience to be more and more convenient for you. Um, Location-specific offers, I think you've probably all heard about iBeacons, one of the, the successful uh, models in the U.S. that's been rolled out now to about 4,000 stores is Macy's Department Stores, where they can interact with the loyalty mobile app and uh, analyze your behavior in order to send you specific uh, deals and offers that are relevant to you as you wake, make your way through, through the store. So you might get a different offer based on your your uh, purchase history and your location in the housewares department versus in the men's clotheswear uh, department. Um, I think we're seeing uh, things to automate uh, transactions more and more. Try and do an auto refill on your, you know, your shaving blades. Just get a subscription. They will just come every, every month. Or the Amazon Dash button where you buy something frequently. You can go on their website, just hit a button, and it'll reorder. Or you can buy a little device, program it to that, and say, every time I hit this, send me a new uh, packet of toilet paper. You can just keep that right in your bathroom. Oh, we're getting low. Hit the button. It'll, it'll arrive in a day or two. So a lot of, lot of potential there for, for helping improve the interactions. I think there's uh, the, some of the more interesting things is how do we get closer and closer uh, to what the customer is valuing versus the product we're selling. And we're seeing some interesting uh, products. Blue Apron is a service in the U.S. that uh, delivers uh, ready-to-cook uh, meals. You can subscribe to a service. Um, they, it's not a takeaway because they're not pre-cooked, but it takes the sh uh, finding a recipe, uh, off of your plate, it outsources that. There's, you can subscribe and say, hey, I, like, I don't eat uh, red meat, but you know, everything else is fine. Or you can go in and select among some, some uh, menus. So it makes it very easy to choose what you might eat. And you don't have to shop. They will send you exactly the right ingredients for the number of servings that you want, all prepared and, and, and ready to cook, along with the instructions for doing it. And so the, what, they're, what they're selling is no shopping, not having to manage your shopping, not having to decide what to cook, but you still have that home-cooked experience. And they're also promoted as, this is a great way for you to spend time with your family cooking and learning to cook better because we've prepared everything for you. It's almost like a little cooking school to help you have home-cooked uh, cooked meals. So very interesting alternative to shopping. Uh, instead of shopping uh, for ingredients, you are actually getting a meal delivered uh, that you can, you can prepare yourself. So you're closer to what the customer is actually wanting, which is, I want a home-cooked meal. Uh, the, I think Amazon Prime is, Prime is really interesting, where they've taken their loyalty program, the, the Prime membership, and really e expanded it in an interesting way. Uh, it was free shipping, but then it's special deals, and then content. You know, your Amazon Prime membership now gives you access to a whole lot of streaming, streaming content. Uh, very interesting how they're taking this, this Prime membership to, to the next level. They already had all the data about your purchases through Amazon, but with the Prime membership, they can actually get a new revenue stream for that and, uh, and bring you into, into new products that you maybe wouldn't uh, normally want. A lot of people bought Prime just to get the free shipping on, on, on everything, but now they're starting to get hooked on Amazon's content. And again, Amazon is a big funder of original content now as well. So getting closer to what the customers want is, is uh, you see a lot of that going on in the retail sector. Um, a lot of the, the retail and, and sales uh, e-commerce sites are also building up the API directly. So not just the customer, new customer experiences, but also how do we actually provide an experience to our partners, to third parties that allow them, their creativity and, and their uh, market presence to, to benefit our business. So can I partner with somebody and instead of giving them a unique experience, I give them an API to some of the core functionality of my business, which then they can uh, leverage their competitive advantage, their unique differentiating talents on top of their unique market that they play in, the unique demographic they appeal to in order to drive business into my core platform 
bypassing the experiences that I give them, but enabling new experiences that maybe I'm not able or, uh, or to conceive or willing to invest in, and a partner can do that. So this is, again, a, a, a critical way to leverage your, uh, your core business and let other, other companies build on it. I thought I'd use government as an example for how important it is to own the identity. Sanjeeva talked a bit about the, the, uh, the security aspects of identity and how important it is for I identity to be done first. Um, government kind of shows, a uh, government sector provides an example that's similar to what you might see in an enterprise or among a community of, of users or customers. Um, in a, in a a government, you might have maybe many different uh, ways that you interact with the entity. You need to register and get a business license, or you need to hire employees, so you need to file paperwork, you need to, to interact, you need to pay your taxes. There's all these ways that you interact with the government. And most governments have a bunch of different uh, departments. Um, a lot of enterprises have a lot of different departments, too, so you can extrapolate this easily to how a customer might interact with a, a large uh, corporation. How do we actually make this a seamless experience? How do we, uh, we make sure that knowledge that one department has can be used in another interaction that the citizen has with the government in order to provide a better experience? And uh, you know, an API and, uh, for these and a federated identity across all of, all of the services is uh, a really key first step. So I can log in, I have my identity that's known across the government uh, that then I can use in order to log in. Uh, the gov the uh, Dubai uh, government has been using WC2 Identity Server for a while to provide a standardized login across all the various uh, properties that they do. So you have your, your, a single ID, you can log in the government. That ID will allow you to log into the parking department to pay your parking fines. It'll allow you to log into the, the water agency and, and pay your water bill. It'll allow you to, to get into many of the different functions of the government with that single ID that is federated across those. And and you can imagine in a you know, country like the U.S. or Australia, we have state governments, we have federal governments. They're, I don't really understand why I have to have a separate California identifier in order to log in and pay my state taxes than I do my federal taxes. Why can't I have, a, a, have a, uh, an ability to federate that and say, here's my federal I identifier and I'm going to give that to the state and say, this is who I am. You can check with the federal government to validate my credentials and allow me to pay my taxes without having, uh, having separate IDs for each, each function. So, um, you know, I think there's a lot of, lot of rich area for exploring this in the government sector, but also across enterprises. In WSO2, we have many, many applications that we, that we use every day. We have Gmail, we have uh, Salesforce, we have NetSuite, we have many, many internal applications uh, that we use. Uh, the WC2 identity server enables us to have a single logon that, that gives us access selectively to all of those services. So not everybody has access to Salesforce. They have uh, you know, only the, the salespeople and, and other people on the business side. Our, our system manages that completely, and if a, an employee leaves, we can say this employee has left, and it, we don't have to propagate it through the system, and it literally is a federated system that will shut off access to, to those uh, systems. Um, or if they change role, maybe they've got a promotion, they have access to more of the systems uh, that are available. We can change their role, those systems will open up uh, for them appropriate to their new role. This is a, a, a very uh, important aspect of employee productivity in, in an organization. As organizations are now accreting through acquisitions, uh, we see a lot of customers uh, ad addressing their identity challenges first. And when you think about collecting data in order to improve operations and predict behaviors and all that, having a, a, a kind of single source of truth for identity is a key, uh, a key uh, um, field that we can key off and, and use to connect up a lot of different data uh, in order to provide a better employee experience, better customer experience, better citizen experience. So I have to bring in IoT. You know, as we're seeing, uh, you know, the the digital, uh, the possibilities for digital information expand. It's natural to start thinking, how can we get more data from the real world? You know, we have, um, 
you know, we all have digital maps now and they're great. Well, they actually collect data in order to provide us traffic information. Um, doesn't matter how they connect it, it can be tracking apps, it can be tracking mobile phones, it can be sensors in, in the road, but once I have an interaction with the physical world, there's a lot more data that I can, I can do to help people out in, in the real world. And um, I, I think IoT is it's just, it's still on the upward uh, curve of the hype curve, uh, because it is, uh, it is pretty new, the, the terminology is new. Uh, customers of ours have been doing this kind of thing for a long time. You know, Hilti, for instance, has been, and Trimble, it's known as a GPS-focused uh, uh, company. How do we track these things? They've been doing a lot with APIs, with integration, before the word IoT really became a, a buzzword. So um, uh, there is a lot of, of momentum in this space, and as the price of devices, as battery life improves, the uh, uh, price of devices drops, there's a lot more opportunities to bring sensors into your environment, actuators, displays, interactions, wearables, ways to collect information uh, from, from the environment and use that in your, to make it a software problem. This is all data that feeds, feeds your software algorithms in order to provide new services, better customer experiences, uh, and, and new digital products. So here's just an example from our IoT server uh, around using analytics to define geofences. This is a very uh, clear and obvious uh, thing to do if you have a device that is location, has location sensors in it to find out you know, what's going on. It could be a vehicle, uh, tracking a vehicle in a fleet. It could be a security. Uh, security uh, system for employee badges or visitor badges, um, things like that, enables you to, to take location of your device or location, hopefully, of a piece of equipment or a person that the device is attached to and do a lot of interesting uh, things on top of that to help that person uh, do their job and, on, or help the enterprise uh, secure uh, the assets that they have. Another example uh, industry that you'll that you can, it's kind of obvious how IoT fits in. There's a lot, there's many, many uh, moving parts in here. We have individual meters on each uh, rate payer's uh, 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 entry point. We have many sensors in the grid itself. We have uh, many sensors and information coming from uh, the energy producers. Um, there's uh, there's a lot of information about customer behavior that we can infer from the, from the usage. Um, there's many ways to tie these things together using software. So for instance, in California, we have a, a plan that you can sign up for to put an IoT device on your air conditioner. And on certain days when there's an excessive demand on energy, it will turn your air conditioner up. So it, it will allow you to be a little hotter. Uh, in order to, to make sure that there's plenty of energy uh, for everybody to use without spinning up expensive additional sources. And that may be slightly less comfortable for you, but they give you a, a very generous incentive to, uh, to do that. Um, and you know, if you're willing to be slightly discomforted on certain days, they will give you quite a bit of, of uh, rate in the back. So all this whole system can be tied together using sensors and, and measuring IoT. Uh, uh, IoT to, to really build a very rich data ecosystem. The richer your data, the more possibilities for your software algorithms to, to chew on and come up with innovative new ways to improve operations or new pr digital products. Healthcare is another example that we're seeing a lot of customers start to use IoT in. And it's kind of obvious first you think about like wearables to monitor uh, mon monitor uh, patients, but in fact, there's a lot going on within hospitals, even managing inventory of, of equipment and, and medical supplies and pharmaceuticals and, uh, and providing displays and, uh, you know, for instance, I think augmented reality is going to be very interesting for, uh, for surgeries and things like that. Right now, many of uh, hospitals are building more and more displays into their operating theaters and into their recovery rooms and, and actually entertainment systems for, for recovering patients. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity for, uh, to, to collect data about hospital operations and patient outcomes in a way that we really haven't seen before. So often you go to the doctor, they do the procedure, they go, you go home, they don't even know really what happened with it. Being able to get feedback through IoT devices, through home monitoring, uh, can really help uh, improve the long-term uh, knowledge about what the outcomes are, what's working, what's not, and really improve the healthcare area. 
Uh, so a lot of, lot of work going on into, into uh, healthcare in, in the IoT space right now. Um, I think I'm running out of time, but uh, I just wanted to kind of reiterate, you know, what's the core of a digital transformation? It's really about making your problems, whatever problem you face as a business, into a software problem. I mean, once, once it's a software problem, then only the imagination is, is your limit. So there's so much that you, that you can do. I remember when I, you know, as cameras evolved, the first camera I had, there was a new one called APS. It was a, still a film camera, but it actually had, would put some little uh, uh, digital signals on the film to say, oh, I took this as a panorama, or this was a, a wide angle or a short angle, and it would record the exposure and things like that onto the film so I could use that information later. And once the cameras started to become digital, the control systems became digital, then all of a sudden there's all these new features I could do. Well, like when I was young, if I wanted to do a time lapse on my little movie, I had to build a little circuit that would, you know, click. And uh, now that's built into the camera, it's simply a software problem. To build time lapse into, into a camera, it's just software. It's a new feature, it's just limited by your imagination. And this is one of the things that's, that's been really exciting in the digital cameras, see how much technology has changed the experience. Now it's got facial recognition built into the camera. It's got panoramic stitching built into the camera. It's got upload directly to Facebook or Instagram dire directly in the camera. It's connecting up through Wi-Fi to do full remote control of your camera so you can set up your camera and then control it uh, remotely. It's really exciting. All those are software problems. Once you've, once you've uh, enabled the underlying, you kind of turned your bricks and mortar into, into uh, uh, digital assets through building IoT devices and APIs, and then creativity is unbounded at that point. So that's it. I, can, I have a couple minutes for uh, questions, but I also think uh, we're a little over time for the break. So maybe if there's a question, I'll take it. Not necessarily all the industries move at the same time. Right? What are those uh, industries that are not actually moving at the mm -hmm. same speed? And if you have to eliminate one of the barriers, uh, which is the cost, and being open source mm -hmm. removes that barrier, which are those industries that are getting primed uh, with your technologies to, mm -hmm. for a transformation? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure I can answer about the, the industries that are not adopting digital transformation, because honestly, we don't see those <laughs> in our day to day. It's the folks who are interested in innovation and digital transformation that are, are coming to us. And you know, we can all uh, point to companies we think are, are dinosaurs. Uh, actually, I, th I think there's a lot of uh, Clearly, there's a lot of, uh, of governments that are especially behind the curve in providing good uh, digital experiences for uh, their customers. Maybe it's much better here in Australia. <laughs> I know our government is extremely pathetic in providing uh, clean technology. UK, very exciting uh, work going on there with the UK digital service where they've said, why are we providing our citizens with services through the web that looked like they were done in 1993, you know, you know, and they're, they're doing a very interesting job coalescing uh, all of their digital properties into a into unified citizen portal that is very, it's user tested, it's constantly evolving, very, very exciting. Uh, so some of the, uh, uh, the, the other uh, part of your question about uh, which uh, industries are, are kind of moving forward the fastest, um, I think uh, there's kind of standouts, folks who are really trying to innovate in every industry. It's, there's so much uh, difference within an industry between those who are, are feeling the threat maybe from a digital native entering the industry, uh, trying to, to solidify their position as leadership or maybe take over a leadership position from those who are very complacent or simply uh, maybe have a desire to, to digitally transform, but they're just unable to transform the culture. I think the culture is the thing that's blocking companies more, more than anything from, from uh, innovating. Because again, it's, once it's software, it's really a failure of imagination and a failure of being able to have a shared imagination of what the possibilities are that's the biggest obstacle to a successful transformation. So.